Another police officer acquitted for the death of Elijah McClain. There is no accountability within the justice system, and today proves it once again. Call Prop HH complex or call it deceptive. We know there are people waiting to vote because of their confusion. So let's answer some more of your questions tonight. A candidate running for a school board seat and from the law turns himself in today, but he'll still be elected tomorrow. The head of Colorado's Republican Party says there is not a fair election anywhere in this state. And she picked up a hobby while in the hospital for treatment. Now it's taken her to the stars. Tonight on Next. The Aurora police officer who almost instantly got physical with Elijah McLean, kicking off the sequence of events that led to that young man's death, has been acquitted today. Suspended Aurora police officer Nathan Woodyard was found not guilty of reckless manslaughter and a lesser charge of criminally negligent homicide. Woodyard was the first officer to stop Elijah McLean that night in August 2019. Police had gotten a call that McLean appeared sketchy. Despite the fact that McLean had done nothing wrong, Woodyard put his hands on him in a matter of seconds, put him in a carotid neck hold that cut off oxygen to his brain. And prosecutors argued that made the officer complicit in McLean's death, even though a number of experts said that it was a dose of ketamine administered by paramedics that killed McLean. Those paramedics have not yet gone on trial. Woodyard is the second Aurora police officer acquitted. One APD officer, Randy Redima, was convicted of criminally negligent homicide. Our Alexander Lewis joins us. Alex, you've been in court throughout these trials, talking with Elijah McLean's mother along the way. Shanine, was she surprised by another not guilty verdict? Kyle, she really wasn't. She said that she was expecting this and she really was trying not to have any expectation. She was incredibly disappointed with the split verdict and the outcome from Rosenblatt and Redeema. I mean, she was visibly heartbroken, so she didn't want to set herself up for that level of heartbreak. Yet still as a spectator, it seemed that today was almost even harder than that first verdict a few weeks ago. You know, when the judge said not guilty, it's all, you could hear a pin drop. I mean, there wasn't a, a lot of verbal reaction from anybody, but if you listen closely enough, you could hear Shanine's soft cries and sobs and she she had to sit there for a while. She sat there for about 10 minutes. She seemed to be paralyzed with emotion before she could stand up and collect herself and walk outside of that courtroom and face all of the cameras, all of the reporters waiting there for her on the back end. It was a tough day and there was a a lot of talk about accountability today. Even Phil Weiser, who was there holding her hand, and uh, the prosecutors who tried this case, they all came to her after the fact and were like, well, you know, this is a step towards progress, right? These officers have seen their day in court. We are making progress when it comes to accountability for police's actions when it comes to young, specifically black men in America. Uh, and Shanine disagrees. This is not justice for her. It's just unfortunate that the people that stopped my son, brutalized my son, tortured my son, get away with murder, and that they're passing on what they did to the medical professionals that still were supposed to do their job. Nobody did. So it's just unfortunate that they're placing the blame and passing the buck. And the paramedics are up next after Thanksgiving. Two paramedics will see their day in court. Shanine says that she will be there for that trial as well every single day. And I really can't fathom uh, what that's like. It's hard enough as a reporter to see body cam video day after day of Elijah McClain dying to hear. I think that's the worst part, to hear Elijah dying day after day as, this, as these trials play out. And uh, Shanine sits there every single day. And I can't imagine what that's like for her, but she is up for the third and final trial in a couple of weeks. Th that is truly the part that's unfathomable as a parent, Alex, the idea that you would hear your child begging for his and her life again and again and again. And as she well knows, most of these times she's come away at the end feeling like justice was not served. I think that's the hardest part. I can't even imagine um, what goes through her head because we have to look back to four years ago. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Shanine, who went to the protests of uh, June of 2020, uh, the summer of unrest with George Floyd, who said, you need to be saying my son's name as well. And that's how Governor Polis paid attention. That's why Phil Weiser took out a grand jury on this particular case. So she has been fighting for justice for four years and to sit in trial after trial and not feel like she's getting that. Uh, we've used every adjective under the sun today to describe how she's feeling, disgusted, dejected, outraged, and it just is not sufficient. I don't know there are words to describe what Shanine McLean has gone through. Alex Lewis, appreciate your reporting. Thank you. Our next big thing tonight 
is a final look before Election Day at Prop HH, the statewide tax measure that will be decided tomorrow. It would reduce some of the coming spike in property taxes in return for Coloradans giving up some or all of their Tabor refunds in coming years. It's one of the most complicated issues ever put before voters in Colorado. From reading it, you might be misled into thinking Prop HH is a tax cut. Now, a charitable view, a positive view of Prop HH is that it is a complex way to tackle a number of difficult issues at once. A less charitable view is that Prop HH is a deceptive way for Democrats to chip away at the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger is answering some of your final Prop HH questions. Everyone whose home is visible in this video from Jefferson County will be impacted by Prop HH differently. The most popular question we've heard about Prop HH, what does it mean for me? We cannot answer that specifically because it depends on your home's property value and your income level. So who wins if Prop HH passes? People who are low income, making less than $50,000 because their Tabor refund will increase next year. And people with high property values will get a bigger discount on their property tax increase. Losers are people with high income, more than $157,000 because they'll see a significant decrease in Tabor refund dollars next year. And people with low property Property values will not see as much of a discount on their property tax increase. It's a bit of a wash if you're low income and in a low property value home and high income and a high property value home. Terry DeBaker and his wife moved from Jefferson County to Douglas County two years ago and lost their senior property tax discount. Part of Prop HH allows that discount to follow a senior if they move to a new home. Terry wanted to know if Prop HH passes, will the policy be retroactive for people who had the discount but lost it when they moved? The answer is yes. The state has records of who had the senior property tax discount, and those who have moved and lost it can apply for it again if Prop HH passes. Seniors 65 and older who have lived in their home for longer than 10 years can apply for a discount on their property tax bill. Through Sunday night, 45% of voters 65 and older had returned their ballots. Overall, just 21% of voters had returned their ballots through last night. I'm amazed at that number every time. I also got a question from Marla in Castle Rock. She qualified for the senior property tax exemption, but never applied for it and then moved. She asked if she could get it right away if Prop HH passes. <coughs> Excuse me, Marla, it's choking me up. That answer is no. You had to have applied and been awarded the senior property tax benefit. If you didn't do that, you have to wait until your 10-year anniversary in your new home. I don't know why it choked me up. <laughs> you, okay? hey, you get into this stuff, man. Uh, this is the governor's big thing. This is the governor's, the governor's big push on this. He told you he doesn't even have a plan B, doesn't have a right. backup. It's all on this. So what will we hear from him tomorrow night? Well, unless I drive eight hours to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, which was something I brought up with the producer, do we want to do that? I won't hear from him. Perhaps we may Zoom. He's at the Western Governors Association uh, winter meeting, which is today through Wednesday. I've asked his team if I could Zoom with him. Otherwise, I've been told it's Senate President Steve Fenberg who's going to be front and center of the cameras at the party, win or lose. In five seconds, tell everybody about this awesome tie, because I love it so much. It's my, my grandfather, my Zadie's tie, Pierre Cardin. It's huge on the bottom. <laughs> it's a great tie. But it's it, it matches what I'm wearing. Yeah. All right, see you for election night. Hey, time to remind you of the next team's annual election eve promise. If you are still holding on to a ballot, you got some question that is keeping you from turning it in and voting. As always, we will give you a one-on-one -on -one answer if you promise to then go vote, email those questions to next at 9news.com. Our team promises to answer if you promise to vote. An unopposed candidate for an at-large seat on the Inglewood School Board is no longer at-large as in wanted by police. Devon Williams, who's a convicted felon for auto theft already, turned himself in today on an open warrant for another auto theft. Williams can still serve on the school board because only a child abuse conviction automatically DQs you under Colorado law. Inglewood police have been publicly calling on Williams to turn himself in during the campaign. He did that today, and he's now out on bond. Williams describes himself as a serial entrepreneur and professional lobbyist. I check state records, and he does not have any lobbying clients. His website lists several business ventures, including a number of web hosting platforms. He hosts several explicit websites. Probably the tamest name, the only one I can say on TV, would be PornLinksXXX. Com. If the prosecutor who handled the Barry Morphew murder case gets disbarred for misconduct, she can no longer serve as district attorney. We know that because D.A. Linda Stanley briefly lost her law license once before. Here's Mark Salinger. 
My name is Linda Stanley. I'm the district attorney for the 11th Judicial District. For a prosecutor in charge of enforcing the law, Linda Stanley now finds herself on the wrong side of an investigation. Thanks for being here for everybody, and there's a couple of things I'd like to address. More than 100 miles from her office in Salida, the Colorado Supreme Court will now hear the complaint into the Republican district attorney in Chafee, Fremont, Park, and Custer counties. Stanley faces a long list of allegations, including launching a secret investigation into the judge presiding over the Suzanne Morphew murder case. Using resources in that manner, clearly designed to intimidate a judge, uh, or if it was for retribution, it's, it's so wrong. It's unethical. Former Judge Ramsey Lama wants Stanley to lose her law license after he says she secretly investigated his family based on conspiracy theories in a YouTube video. After the complaint was filed by the Attorney Regulation Council to the Supreme Court last week, Stanley now has 28 days to respond. From there, the case proceeds much like a civil case. The evidence will eventually be heard by a presiding disciplinary judge who will then make a ruling. Legal experts say there's a very real possibility Stanley is disbarred. In Colorado, district attorneys are required to have a law license. If they lose their license, another lawyer takes over the office of the district attorney. We know that because that's already happened once to Linda Stanley. Court documents show in 2022, Stanley's law license was temporarily suspended after she failed to complete mandatory legal education requirements. Now, she could lose it permanently. I think an elected official who's the top prosecutor uh, using investigative resources, taxpayer dollars, to investigate a judge. And I think if you're engaging in that kind of conduct, you have no business being a DA. The governor's office and attorney general's office both tell me that they're watching how this plays out in the Supreme Court. Even if the state launched an investigation into Linda Stanley, the Supreme Court complaint would likely be much quicker to determine whether Stanley did anything wrong. In theory, Kyle, locals in the district could also launch some sort of recall petition. Talking with county commissioners this weekend, though, that seems unlikely. Does this have the potential to blow up a whole bunch of cases there? Yeah, I mean, we're already hearing from lawyers who are saying, well, if this creates doubt in this case, then why don't we look at all the other cases that she's prosecuted? Again, that's down the line, but you're already starting to hear those trickles of doubt of, hey, maybe this is a bigger deal than just this case. Mark Salinger, thank you. Come Thanksgiving time, you are going to hear a lot about the annual Feed a Family event in memory of Daddy Bruce Randolph. And a bunch of next viewers are going to be able to say, we helped make that happen because you've raised more than $25,000 to buy Thanksgiving meals for families in need. It is your latest Word of Thanks Microgiving, now 177 weeks and $11.5 million strong. Do you know of someone, nonprofit, with a holiday event that could use our help? If you know of anybody out there that could use our assistance, Email ideas to me at next at 9news.com. There are no fair elections in Colorado. The Colorado GOP goes all in on election conspiracies, cozying up with a white nationalist and hosting the woman who falsely claims that she's the governor of Arizona. Rolls out the red carpet for a young interviewer who found her passion while in the hospital. That's next. The Colorado Republican Party is clearly increasingly comfortable with a variety of extremists. Just over the weekend, linking up with a well-known white nationalist, as well as one of America's most famous election deniers. Carrie Lake claims that she is the duly elected governor of Arizona. She is not the governor of Arizona. She lost. But she is a hero among election deniers. And she headlined the Colorado GOP's annual fundraising dinner over the weekend. Lake is a supporter of Colorado Republican Chairman Dave Williams' effort to block unaffiliated voters from Republican primaries. On Friday, Williams made an appearance on a show hosted by Laura Loomer, a white nationalist who has said that America was a white ethno state that was then destroyed by diversity. Williams told Loomer he thinks a judge in Denver is going to side with the voters who are suing to keep Donald Trump off the primary ballot in Colorado. He thinks they're going to lose that one. He and Loomer claim this lawsuit is election interference by the Democratic deep state. That's when Williams made one of his most sweeping claims yet about Colorado's elections. There are no fair elections in Colorado, all right? Uh, we, have, we have a hyper-partisan election official, Jenna Griswold, who puts her thumb on the scale. No question about that. She doesn't want to enforce uh, cleaning up the voter rolls. She doesn't want to enforce signature verification. She doesn't want to keep Donald Trump on the ballot, even though he's a qualified candidate and should be allowed on the ballot. She does everything possible to do things 
that undermined our actual democratic process. The Colorado Republican Party's embrace of election conspiracy theorists and now a white nationalist is not turning out to be very profitable. The party sent out fundraising blasts about the fight to keep Trump on the Colorado ballot. The chairman says that has brought in less than $1,000 so far. We'll be right back. Being a patient at Children's Hospital gave her perspective on chasing her dreams. She didn't waste time. She accomplished her goal before she turned 20. And Maya Abramson is still at it. I was diagnosed with a metastasized brain tumor three weeks before my third birthday. Hi, I'm Maya Abrahamson, celebrity interviewer. I've had 26 brain surgeries, and when I was 18, halfway through my senior year, I was diagnosed with recurrence of my tumor. I got started at the Seacrest Studios at Children's Hospital Colorado. My name is Maya. I had uh, been going to the hospital multiple times a week for appointments and I was really sick of it. And once the Seacrest Studios opened, it became this place that just was an escape. I can't believe I'm actually talking to you right now. It was a perfect fit that was all about pop culture because that's always what I've been passionate about. I decided to start reaching out to celebrities and these people who have their work has made such an impact on my life. I did 300 celebrity interviews, and I've interviewed people um, like Sir Patrick Stewart, um, Jesse Eisenberg, Zachary Levi. You played Aaron Burr in Hamilton. There are some that I still can't believe I talked with them. <laughs> so what's the hardest part of walking the red carpet? My sister is the one who knows what she's doing with the camera, so I just let her set it up, and then I just focus on the interview. <laughs> and once the studio opened and when I started my show and started interviewing, I knew that th this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Pop culture has been what has helped me through uh, my medical journey and yeah, shows and movies and music, it's all been my escape. Maya's going to be out interviewing celebrities on the red carpet at the Denver Film Festival this week. Tonight, she's interviewing actor and director Michael Shannon of Boardwalk Empire fame. Marissa has your feedback. Nice vest. That's next. Finish with your feedback. Chuck wrote in about Alex Lewis's coverage of the Elijah McClain trials. Chuck said, as we watch the news day after day, it never ceases to forget what people like Alex go through, what journalists go through, listening to Elijah McClain dying over and over and over again. He said it puts in perspective what so many journalists do day after day. Kay says, as a watcher of your show, I know how much you dislike dishonest trickery. I don't like it, Kay. That's right. She says there's a group texting voters with messages stating that Democrats are voting no on Prop HH. She wants me to call that out. Well, I mean, some Democrats are going to vote no. I've heard opposition from progressives, some, from some mainline Dems. But if you're asking about the most prominent Democrats in the state, they are almost all entirely in lockstep behind the governor in support of HH. That does sound like dishonest trickery, Kay.